McEnany. Good evening. McEnany, yeah. Uh, my name is Terry Covington, and I'd like to welcome you to uh, this convening of the fall 1995 edition of the Geneva Lecture Series here at the University of Iowa. I'm a member of the Geneva Lecture Series Committee, and I teach in the Department of Political Science. Our featured speaker tonight is uh, Professor George Marsden. Professor Marsden will be speaking on the topic, The Soul of the American University, from Protestant Establishment to Established Non-Belief. He will be introduced by Professor Dwight Bozeman of the University of Iowa. He's a joint appointment in history and the School of Religion. Professor Matt's, Matt Marsden's talk excuse me, is sponsored tonight by the Geneva Lecture Series and co-sponsored by the University Lecture Committee and the Department of History. We want to especially thank the latter two for their uh, financial support of bringing Professor Marsden here to the university. Before I turn the introductions over to uh, Professor Bozeman, I'd like to tell you a little bit about the Geneva Lecture Series, uh, which is sponsoring the, uh, Professor Marsden's visit. The Geneva Lecture Series is uh, supported by the Christian Reform Campus Ministry and a number of other campus and church organizations in Iowa City. You will find most of those groups, in fact, identified in your uh, program for the evening. And we're very grateful for their support as well. The main function of the Geneva Lecture Series is to provide an ongoing program of speakers who are brought to the campus about once a semester. It's motivated by the belief that Christianity can provide a fruitful foundation for intellectual inquiries. And I wanted to read for you a little bit from uh, Professor Marsden's book itself because he speaks uh, directly to the, uh, what, what motivates the Geneva Lecture Series. Let me just find this passage for you very quickly here. In describing his own, uh, his own approach to uh, uh, academics and to his faith, he states that, my point of view is that of a fairly traditional Protestant of the Reformed theological heritage. One of the features of that heritage is that it has valued education that relates faith to one's scholarship. Particularly important is the beliefs about God, God's creation, and God's will and provision for humans should have impact on scholarship, not just in theology, but also in considering other dimensions of human thought and relationships. And I think that captures very well what the Geneva Lecture Series is about as well. So we're especially pleased to have uh, Professor Marsden here with us tonight. Let me say a few things about the format for the rest of the evening. Uh, following Professor Bozeman's introduction, uh, Dr. Marsden will deliver his address. It will run about 45 minutes. And then I'll be pleased to take questions from the audience. And uh, we're going to try, I'm, I may run up and down the aisles with this microphone trying to amplify people's questions. We'll see how that works. Uh, following his talk, uh, those of you who are so inclined, we will adjourn to the Wesley House at 120 North Dubuque, uh, where we will have uh, refreshments and uh, can follow up on a number of the issues raised this evening. Uh, before I finish, I'd like to draw your attention to the book table that's outside uh, the lecture tonight. In conjunction with Professor Marsden's visit, we've arranged to offer his book, uh, The Soul of the American University, uh, and a number of other books as well. And they're all at a 20% discount, and there's no uh, sales tax, so it's, it's a real bargain. If you think you might want to learn more about Professor Marsden's ideas, uh, I urge you to spend a few minutes at the book table following the presentation. In addition, uh, if you're so inclined, we are taping and recording the talk, and so if you'd like to get a cassette of the talk, a video, uh, excuse me, a video, an audio cassette of the talk, those will be available at the end of the evening also for three dollars a tape. The last thing, uh, hopefully you were handed out a questionnaire as you entered the, the room, and we would greatly appreciate it if you would fill that out and hand it to one of the ushers on your way out this evening. Okay, now to uh, properly introduce Professor Marsden, I give you Dwight Bozeman. Oh, one last thing. It turns out I was perusing each of their vitas this evening before the talk. And uh, they have at least a couple of interests in common. Uh, the obvious one is that both of them study uh, religion and education, different aspects of that in America. But less obvious is they both have a connection to uh, Duke University. Um, <coughs> Professor Bozeman earned his PhD there, and Professor Marsden has taught there. So if you happen to overhear them talking, and they talk about Mike Krzyzewski rather than uh, Jonathan Edwards, you'll know what they're doing. <laughs> so, with no further ado, I uh, give it to you, Professor Bozeman. It is a pleasure to help welcome George Marsden to Iowa City and to the Geneva Forum. 
I'm going to be very brief. Here are some of his credentials. His bachelor's degree from Haverford College, 1959, B.D. Bachelor of Divinity degree from Westminster Theological Seminary in 63, master's degree, Yale University, 61, Ph.D. there, 65. He has held faculty positions at Calvin College, Trinity Evangelical Divinity School, the University of California at Berkeley, the Divinity School at Duke University, and he is today the Francis A. You just told me how to pronounce this, and I've forgotten. But the Francis A. McCannany Professor of History at the University of Notre Dame. For his scholarly achievements, he has received a fair pouch full of awards, including two Eternity Magazine Book of the Year prizes. The first one for his work, Fundamentalism in American Culture, published in 1980 by Oxford University Press, and which made him the preeminent American authority on that subject. The second one, for his history of Fuller Theological Seminary in California, titled Reforming Fundamentalism. He was president of the American Society of Church History in 1992, and has received this year, or perhaps this, last year for this year, a prestigious John Simon Guggenheim Fellowship. George's most recent foray has been into the discussion of the religious and the secular in modern America, with particular reference to the world of higher learning of colleges and universities. Those interested in this subject can consult one of the books outside on the table, The Secularization of the Academy, a book George co-edited in 1992, and his own most recent book, also out there, The Soul of the American University, brought out last year by Oxford University Press. That is the subject to which he invites our attention tonight. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be with you, and I'm grateful to the various sponsoring agencies for this opportunity. I must confess that before the lecture, Dwight and I were talking about Jonathan Edwards uh, rather than about Mike Krzyzewski, but uh, that's somewhat to my chagrin, though Duke basketball has, has fallen on hard times of late. Sometimes when I, I, I think about the years I've spent in history, uh, it, the, the tune still goes through my mind from my teenage days uh, that has the phrase, the words, uh, I don't know much about history. I, I, if some of you are historians, you might have that feeling as you uh, go to class or you prepare for prelims or, uh, or the like. Uh, I have about a, a 2K memory and uh, I sometimes wondered whether I should have been in the profession of history. But the, the one thing that I do... Yeah, maybe the... Uh, I have two mics that, or two things that maybe are fighting with each other. I, I'm not sure what they... Uh... Do you have a solution up there? Now, is that better? That's a, I think that that has it. Okay, let's try it. Well, I haven't said anything significant as yet anyway. <laughs> but what I was leading up to is saying that the one thing I do know about history is that the key to it is to ask an interesting question. And if you ask an interesting question, then you may get an interesting answer. And so, I. I think that the question that, that I've asked about religion and American education fits that category. Because if you think about it, uh, we live in a peculiar cultural arrangement that almost all Americans, if you ask them on a poll, will claim to believe in God and about half of them claim to be uh, Christian and, and, uh, and uh, or some other religion in, in a fairly traditional sense. 
But this same culture, where there is that level of profession of religious belief, takes it for granted that when we are teaching the next generation that God is irrelevant to that teaching, so that in places of worship, people typically learn that their religion should not be simply a matter of uh, religious services, but should uh, be an everyday uh, sort of affair. But when it comes to teaching their children or the next generation, the assumption of the culture is that uh, belief in God is not really relevant to the really important things of life uh, that you might learn about, uh, such as uh, thinking about other people, thinking about society, politics, uh, economics, uh, one's career, uh, human nature and destiny, if you think there's any such thing, moral values. Regarding all those uh, things, uh, young people are taught to think as though God did not exist. In uh, Stephen Carter's book, The Culture of makes a, an interesting observation is on the subject of, of God in public life. And what Carter points out is that the problem in our culture is not so much that uh, religion is discriminated against, but rather that it's trivialized, that, that in fact we have a good bit of room in our public life for talk about God. You, you know, someone says, I thank the good Lord that my curveball was breaking real good last night. And uh, it's, it's a, a, allowable to mention God, but uh, on the other hand, uh, God is not taken seriously as a, uh, a, a subject in our public uh, culture or as, or as a factor to think about. Uh, but rather, as Carter points out, uh, religious belief is treated in our culture typically uh, as though it were a private hobby. Uh, a harmless thing that you may be into, uh, like uh, sailboarding or model airplane building or, or, or so, and you can get your magazines and talk to your little group about that, but it's not something that you would talk about in a general kind of uh, conversation. And so religion uh, is typically treated that, here we go, uh, religion is, is typically uh, treated that way in our educational uh, setting as uh, something like the chess club, that it's a, an all right private activity for people uh, to have, uh, but it's not regarded as uh, important enough to uh, relate to what one learns about, uh, for instance, uh, in, in a university, or people aren't taught to uh, think about what's the relationship between uh, these rather remarkable kinds of religious beliefs that I, I'm uh, firm on the one hand and the other kinds of things I'm thinking about in life uh, on uh, the other. Now, I think the, the negative treatment of religion in mainstream academic life uh, is partly a, a factor of the trivialization of religion, but it goes beyond that because uh, it's not simply that our system deals with God as though he were irrelevant to public life. Uh, it's not simply that the subject of theology is neglected, but the, the real message of this trivialization, uh, if you think about it, is that, uh, the, uh, it, that we are teaching people to think as though God did not exist, as though that question had been settled uh, in uh, mainstream academia. And so that uh, the message that we uh, send to uh, the next generation is that uh, you should learn to think about the important things of life as though you believe that God did not exist. Now, we take that for granted. It seems uh, it's simply the way things are, and for a lot of people it seems to be a matter of common sense that this is the kind of cultural arrangement that we should have. But if you think about it, people from another era uh, or another planet or whatever who came and looked at a culture like this would think this is a very strange way for a culture uh, to behave. There's a strange anomaly. If, if a uh, St. Augustine came back and you had to explain 
uh, that, well, in our culture, uh, most people believe in God, but because it might offend somebody, we don't, uh, try, we don't think about that belief. It's, it's taken for granted. You shouldn't think hard about uh, that in relation to other things that you learn. Uh, th this would be, uh, it would take a lot of explaining to say, well, why, if you believe in a being as immense as uh, you claim that God is, why wouldn't you relate it to the other things that you're thinking about uh, or learning about or studying? At least those people who do believe those things ought to be encouraged to think about uh, those things. So that's the basis for my historical question, that, that anomaly in our culture. I, I've asked a question, how did our culture come to be defined that way? Specifically, how did our academic culture come to be structured in uh, that, with that definition of where religion would be? And particularly, that's an interesting question if you go back and think about it, that in fact, our educational institutions almost all have as their predecessors uh, colleges that had strongly religious, specifically uh, Christian uh, sort of, uh, of character, that our educational system grows out of a time when Protestantism was uh, either formally or informally established uh, as the, uh, the dominant religion in our culture. So that state universities typically, I don't know uh, the very early history of Iowa, was, was, uh, but uh, many of the state universities were essentially Protestant universities so that schools such as Michigan and Indiana had uh, professors uh, who were uh, from particular pr uh, Protestant denominations. Uh, one of the factors in the founding of American uh, universities uh, bearing on the subject of religion was that uh, in order to modernize American higher education, it was felt that uh, this sectarian kind of uh, aspect of the religious tradition had to be gotten uh, rid of. And also, uh, the establishment uh, had to be uh, disestablished, uh, at least to some extent. Most of the people who founded American universities were uh, New Englanders of the uh, generation uh, who came of age during the Civil War. Uh, they were people who uh, identified very much with the Yankee cause and with the kinds of things that the Northern cause uh, stood for, particularly uh, the ideals of a unified national civilization. Uh, they had fought for the Union, uh, combined with uh, high moral ideals. They had fought for uh, the abolition of slavery. Uh, and uh, they were also typically Republicans who were interested in building a strong capitalist uh, civilization uh, and the universities would fit into uh, that sort of program, that universities would stand for uh, building national unity, building a strong economy, uh, and uh, for high moral ideals. Uh, this, the, the people who founded the universities were typically uh, rather broad-minded or, or liberal Protestants uh, who uh, considered uh, what they were doing as essentially consistent with their uh, Protestant uh, sorts of uh, ideals, uh, that uh, they uh, believed that uh, what was best for the nation was to uh, build a, a culture that would uh, stand not for uh, sectarian sorts of religious ideas, but for ideas that would be uh, considered essentially uh, non-sectarian ideals. So that uh, they moved theology uh, away from the centers of the university, sometimes in the divinity school or sometimes uh, simply neglected it altogether, and emphasized that the heart of the religious tradition they were preserving would be uh, non-divisive ideals or, or unifying ideals uh, of uh, morality, that religion was defined uh, largely uh, as a set of moral ideals. Furthermore, they emphasized that the universities would be non-sectarian by being built around a scientific ideal. And science was defined in the late 19th and early 20th century when this was going on as a 
an activity that would be freed from uh, prior commitments or prejudices. Uh, science was uh, defined essentially as inquiry into uh, uh, natural phenomenon uh, without uh, preconception, so that science would be a unifying activity. Everyone uh, from all different sectarian kinds of views could agree on scientific uh, thinking, uh, and it would be a sort of uh, ultimate non-sectarianism. The universities that emerged in the early 20th century were uh, still conceived of as uh, quite consistent with a broad Protestant cultural uh, program. They, they were often still referred to as part of Christian uh, culture. Uh, but the distinctive religious traditions who, uh, that would be divisive were moved to uh, a side. Uh, actually, the University of Iowa had one of the more interesting responses to that situation in the early 20th century uh, with the founding of the, the, uh, the School of uh, Religion in 1924, uh, which was funded by uh, religious groups, uh, but was, uh, also had an affiliation with the, with the university, but included representatives of Protestant, Catholic, and, and Jewish uh, religious perspectives. Uh, the university, uh, as I understand it, took this over in 1938, uh, and eventually the, uh, the, the, the School of Religion became directed uh, uh, not so much toward representing religious points of view as studying religion from uh, a, uh, a more objective or scientific uh, sort of view, which would be, uh, in effect, regarded as a higher point of view by which to view uh, religious uh, beliefs. Well, uh, during the, the mid 20th century, the distinctly Christian dimensions of these arrangements tended to fade away. People talked about uh, the Judeo-Christian heritage or maybe the Western cultural heritage, uh, the heritage of the free world, the democratic heritage that would be uh, represented in the universities. Can you, uh, Can you fix me? Okay, let's try. Uh, I still hear it. Can you put this one over for a minute? I can work with that if, if, it, if it works, <laughs> if, I don't, if I don't move. Right. During the 1950s, when, when, when people talked about the consensus era in American uh, intellectual life, uh, it was, uh, there was sort of a broadly a Judeo-Christian uh, ideal, uh, democratic ideals uh, united around the authority of a scientific uh, sort of methodology. Uh, in the 1960s, it's that establishment that, that came under attack. Uh, and the attack uh, was focused not so much at the religious dimensions of, uh, of the cultural arrangement, even though it was white Anglo-Protestant males who were uh, being attacked, but the Protestant part of it had faded uh, to uh, a large extent. But the attack uh, was particularly on the idea that uh, one uh, ethno-religious group could uh, speak for uh, the whole of academia, or, or, and, and the, the, the coordinated with that attack was the attack on the idea of scientific objectivity, that people uh, said that science 
uh, doesn't uh, operate independent of one's uh, social, sociological commitments, uh, but is to some extent uh, uh, grounded in uh, prior commitments uh, to various kinds of interpretive uh, traditions. Uh, now, despite the uh, attacks of the 1960s, which tended to drive away explicit uh, expression, uh, whatever explicit expression of religion uh, on, uh, within the classrooms of colleges and universities uh, that had been left, uh, the uh, impetus uh, of the era still involved uh, a strong impetus toward building a unified uh, national uh, culture. In fact, uh, it's during this period that you have the vast expansion of the role of government uh, in higher education. Uh, and uh, the government was particularly interested in bringing together uh, uh, all people uh, regardless of race and, and creed and so forth. And, and so uh, there was an interest in building a unified uh, culture that uh, academia would uh, play an important role in. The goal uh, was uh, a goal to build uh, more diversity, and that has become one of the, the standard kinds of aspects of our, our culture uh, since then. And diversity, of course, uh, is a very important goal uh, when uh, it means treating people equally uh, without uh, regard for racial or ethnic background. But with respect to uh, the role of religion in higher education, the goal of diversity has had uh, a peculiar kind of effect uh, on uh, the, the place of religion uh, because uh, as there's been more and more talk about the role of having diversity in, in education, there's been more and more pressure to remove uh, religious belief entirely from education uh, on the grounds that it tends to be uh, divisive or on the grounds that it might uh, tend to offend some. So uh, the policy has the opposite effect uh, from uh, promoting diversity with respect to religion, but rather what's happened is that uh, we have a culture that promotes a uniform and I think rather bland kind of uniformity uh, with regard to religion and public education that is that religion, uh, uh, religious perspectives uh, will not be mentioned. God will not uh, have any uh, role in such education. So it promotes a multicultural ideal uh, that's supposed to take other cultures seriously, but it does so while ignoring the religious parts of culture, which anyone who studies culture knows is one of the most crucial parts of any particular cultural heritage. So what we say in our educational system is, in effect, we invite people of diverse uh, heritages and backgrounds to uh, be part of our educational community, uh, but by the way, uh, leave your, the religious dimension of your culture uh, at the door uh, when you come to our multicultural uh, institution. So instead of promoting uh, diversity with respect to religion, uh, it's still part of this long-term uh, tendency of our culture to uh, promote uh, uniformity and to move religion out of any uh, sphere that might be considered public uh, into a purely private uh, sort of domain. So in summary, uh, uh, in the interest of building a peaceful and unified economically productive society of diverse people, uh, re serious religious concerns have been moved to uh, the private uh, domain. Now we can understand, I think, why that would happen, that there are good reasons uh, why that would happen. First of all, I think religious establishments are a bad idea and it's good that the Protestant establishment was gotten uh, rid of, that you have to treat all religions uh, equally. Uh, and second, one can see that in the interest of devising a peaceful society, that liberal polity is a wonderful invention. Uh, we only have to look at the former Yugoslavia to see uh, something of the danger of the alternatives where you have a situation where there's all too much religion uh, in public uh, life. And so we can value uh, these sorts of liberal uh, arrangements as, having, uh, as performing some valuable kinds of services. But 
that, however we value that, we should not be taken in by the myth that liberalism is therefore ideologically neutral. Uh, by excluding all religiously based philosophies from public discourse, however good the reasons might be, uh, what we do in effect is favor other philosophies that are purely secular or purely naturalistic uh, in their outlook. They're the only ones that people are taught to take seriously. So we're not talking about uh, neutrality toward religion, we're talking about a, a system of education that tends to favor or promote uh, non-religious views. Moreover, although we have to value keeping the peace, we also have to recognize that secular liberal traditions have proven unable to give uh, very compelling accounts of what the good should be for this diverse society uh, that we're trying to uh, hold together. Uh, the only good that we seem to be able to agree on is the good of tolerance. Uh, and, and I think that's uh, pretty well illustrated in the condition of our public schools. And tolerance, of course, is another wonderful uh, ideal. But if you've eliminated everything else but tolerance, uh, then one wonders uh, where are ideals for uh, how do you decide, how do you adjudicate disputes uh, among uh, different groups uh, who uh, have some substantial kinds of differences uh, of, of opinion. Uh, how do you uh, get beyond the kind of uh, moral impasse that we see uh, often in academia or in its popular counterpart uh, of, of the sort of more radical academia, uh, which I think you see on MTV. How do we get to uh, answering some of the fundamental questions that humans ought to be uh, trying to, to ask, or at least how do some people get to these? And I'm not saying everyone should uh, agree on the same uh, answers to these questions, but uh, what uh, ways do we have to answer questions like, how do you find a basis for your moral judgments? Uh, is, there, is there any basis for virtue that can transcend uh, simply uh, the power of the group uh, that's in control? Uh, can we know uh, anything about reality that goes beyond our socially uh, determined constructions? Are there any essential traits about uh, the human uh, character or condition? Now, scholars whose intellectual lives are informed by religious beliefs are, are going to give uh, a lot of different and sometimes mutually exclusive answers to those sorts of questions. But the point is that with God in the picture, uh, at least some people will be uh, in a position to provide uh, constructive alternative ways to looking at those uh, questions that might get beyond the dysfunctional sorts of impasses uh, that our culture uh, is uh, in uh, today. Uh, so that uh, it seems that one of the striking questions that should be asked about our culture is why don't academics uh, who do believe in God do more, uh, uh, put more effort into reflecting on the academic implications of those beliefs? Uh, particularly.